All right. We are here with Marissa Bethany. Marissa, thank you for taking the time this morning. I sure appreciate you being here. You are rocking and rolling with your precious skin elixirs. And I wanted to have you on this morning to talk a little bit about that and a little bit about clean beauty and foxiness and how that all kind of meshes together. Excellent. Well, thank you, Terry. Thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to speak with you and dive into all these foxy topics. You bet. Right off bat, I'd like to know how is it that you kind of fell into formulating and creating skincare products? Because that's not something everybody does. So how, how did you kind of fall into that role? Well, um, it really became a passion um, when I wanted to heal my own skin troubles, um, namely hormonal acne that I was experiencing during my second pregnancy. And um, I feel like a lot of women, like that's when the move to really clean up ingredients and get rid of like, you know, toxins and food and skincare and all that stuff. Pregnancy really is that time when that you know, the, the need really starts to become more urgent. So um, I wanted to heal my skin and I did not want to put anything on topically that could cause problems for my pregnancy. You know, things like Retin-A and um, a lot of other synthetic ingredients that are effective for acne in the short term um, just aren't healthy while you're pregnant. And I've since learned they're just really not good for the, the skin overall, regardless of, you know, if you're carrying a, a baby or not. Um, so I just started really experimenting with natural oils. Um, I think I used rosehip and argan and carrot seed oil as my first kind of um, homemade blend. And it worked. It, I was really amazed at how my skin responded to these natural ingredients and um, things really started to calm down. Um, I felt better. Like I just liked using these products. I looked forward to using my little homemade skin oil. Um, I started using it all over my body. Friends started asking <laughs> for bottles and, um, and then like their, you know, sisters and mom were like stealing their bottles. So I had to make more. And um yeah, it just became this fun, like joyful, light sort of thing I was doing. And um, a few years, it wasn't a few years until after that point that I actually started um, making more seriously and formulating with the idea of starting a company. Clean beauty. This is something that's kind of become a trend here mm. within the last couple of years. And so when you talk about things like Retin-A, okay, well, why, why isn't that so good for your skin? What about these synthetic things? Why, why, if they're not good for your skin, why would they be in a product in the first place? And that's, that's my first question. And then the second would, the follow-up of that is, okay, well, then what, what's this clean beauty thing all about? Well, the short answer to your first question is because they're inexpensive and they're reliable. Um, a synthetic ingredient is just a lot cheaper to produce and it's reliable. You know, nature, of course, with harvests and all the variables involved in natural ingredients, it can be really expensive to formulate with natural, natural ingredients. And, um, Big beauty just really doesn't necessarily, um, you know, it's more of a profit-based culture in traditional beauty markets, um, as opposed to a people-first movement, which the clean beauty movement really is a people and planet-first kind of movement. However, um, I do feel like that term clean beauty has sort of 
garnered, um, or maybe not garnered, it's, it's gathered a bit of a stigma around it. Uh, you know, I think the idea of clean and pure as a movement is really beautiful. However, it's starting to feel a little confined by this idea that unless it's a 100% clean and, you know, the ingredients are rendered in a certain way, then it's, then it's not good at all. And it's sort of become this very, um, a little bit of an extreme kind of feeling for me in the market of um, what I'm kind of calling just like the niche independent beauty category, which is where I consider myself to be in. Mm-hmm. So what I'm hearing is it's, uh, there's, <laughs> it's kind of like uh, dieting nowadays where, where we've gone from, okay, well, maybe we should go ahead and incorporate a few plants and vegetables into the diet to, okay, vegetarianism, now veganism, now like, and further on into that, where we start moving into orthorexia, where you are giving yourself basically problems because you have to be eating this specific way. It sounds that in certain circles, there, there is this orthorexia of, of beauty. Am I hearing that correctly? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to compare it. It it is, it's become a little intense and a little bit um, on that extreme side where there can be such a heavy focus on the way something is made as opposed to really staying in touch with the lightness and the, and the fun and the, and the joy of natural skincare. I mean, you know, the way I see it, it's, it is important to have pure ingredients. It is important to know where something is being sourced, if it's fair trade or organic or wildcrafted as much as possible. Um, and sustainable are things harvested in a way that's helping the earth as opposed to just, you know, taking from the earth and, and damaging our, our ecosystem. Um, but yeah, th- so it's been interesting to watch sort of this evolution of this grassroots movement of beauty sort of really being reclaimed by the individual and not having it be connected to these larger industries that really have such a heavy focus on synthetic ingredients and stabilizers and preservatives and all of these things that are more for the convenience of the manufacturer than for the health of the consumer. So how do we go about kind of finding the balance between using just corporate beauty and the orthorexic side where where's the how do we find that middle ground my philosophy is to practice intuitive skincare and an intuitive approach to beauty and all the things that you want to nourish your your skin with which could be skincare products like oils and mists and cleansers and all of that it could be um it could be makeup it could be shampoo, it could be anything that you feel is, is part of that realm of that um, outside in type of care. That's my answer is to be just go with your intuition. And, you know, I'm starting to see a lot of bloggers and um, voices who I really respect start to loosen their um, parameters on, you know, clean beauty versus conventional beauty and all of that. It's kind of exciting to see somebody just use what they want, but from an informed place where they know what they're putting on their skin. And ultimately a lot of what goes on the skin goes into the body. So uh, I think it's, it's just important to follow your intuition and really check in with what, what feels right. I can so relate to that as, as a Chinese medicine practitioner, we, we talk a lot about kind of everything in moderation and learning what's best for your body. 
And so having that awareness and learning, okay, yeah, you know, this, this ingredient or this food or this, this herb affects me in this way. Okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't really care for that. So let me, let me think about doing something else or, you know, I mean, <laughs> it, it really boils down to a lot more of the awareness, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Well, yeah. And we're so individual. We're so unique in our constitutions. We all have different needs and different ways we react to different ingredients, whether it's topical or internal, different foods, different things, environments affect so many of us each differently. And, um, you know, we're not, we're not static, even though our body is, you know, pretty much the same day to day. Every time we wake up, we're we're the same body. We still need to make adjustments along the way and really listen to what it is that we need, you know, especially where the seasons change too. That's a big place to really sort of drop in and ask, you know, what, what do we need? What adjustments need to be made in terms of the way we're, we're feeding ourselves or nourishing our skin or, um, the level of activity we're engaged in or the level of rest we need. It's all, um, I see it as this holistic way of just approaching care, care of the body, care of the soul, just complete way of caring for one's being. I, again, you're, you're speaking my language here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in Chinese medicine, we very much try to teach people how to live in harmony with the seasons. And in fact, one of, um, one of my favorite Chinese medicine books, I actually have it uh, right here with me, Staying Healthy with the Seasons by Ellison Haas. Uh, fantastic book that kind of teaches all about Chinese medicine, its theory, and how we work in harmony with our environment and the seasonal changes. Uh, for example, uh, right now we're, we're in the season of fall. Um, as, as At this time of the recording, and uh, the show will probably still be released while we're in fall, but uh, fall is actually related to the lung and the large intestine in Chinese medicine. And these are the organs that relate to the skin. They control the skin. So fall is an excellent time for assessing your skincare needs. Mm. That's, that's beautiful. I didn't know that about fall time and, and how it is relate what the organs and that it's, um, it's interesting because I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, in astrology, Virgo, the season we just finished rules the digestive system. And I believe um, Libra, the season that we are in right now, rules the lung. So I love learning about these correlations. Um, yeah, fall is any transition season, fall and spring. Those are my two favorite seasons to really focus on assessing as you, as you put it so perfectly. Um, really taking that time to consider what are the adjustments needed um, almost in preparation for that next big season ahead. I I see fall as that time where we're preparing our homes, we're preparing our, you know, just so much of our lives right now in fall for winter, at least where I live in New England, that's a big deal to get everything, you know, all the pots have to be put in the shed and all (laughs) <laughs> Got to get the wood, you know, ready for, you know, burning and all of that stuff. Um, and the same thing goes for skincare to sort of rotate out what's not really going to be serving for the different weather months ahead. On your Instagram page, one of the things that you've got posted there is beauty as ritual energy healing. Yes. What does that mean? So I see beauty ritual as a time for personal energy care. It's really one of those great moments, typically twice a day or or once a day, depending, um, where you're sort of all, you know, someone's already 
kind of there in that space of self-care. So I like to take it another step and say, well, hey, you know, you can layer in personal energy medicine in this time. And um, <clears throat> basically, it's an opportunity to ground and to open up to the flow and the pulse of life and the way you want to flow with that pulse. Do you want to flow in joy? Do you want to flow in ease? Or, you know, oftentimes if it's an unconscious choice, I know for me, that's when I find myself flowing with, <laughs> with you know, things that aren't so joyful and easy. So, so yeah, so I, it's a, it's a great time to just be, you know, bring mindfulness and an intention to those five or 10 minutes that you're standing there at your bathroom countertop. That's something I would not have ever considered, but as a holistic medicine practitioner, I, I think it's great incorporating that mindfulness with your skincare regimen. Fantastic. Well, it's, it, it brings a, a, a depth to the experience and it kind of, um, you know, it really transforms the touch that you're already doing upon your face. It, it makes that touch more, um, more meaningful. It gives that moment in time. It's sort of like a, a replenishment time. You know, when, when um, and I know Terry, you, you know all about this, the, the yin and yang energies, right? Where even though um, you're actively doing something like you're cleansing your face, you're moisturizing, you're, you're giving maybe a massage along the jawline to release some of that lymph stagnation and open up where there might be tension. That's active, but it's also a time of replenishment. So it is sort of like a yin time. And especially before sleep, it is really, it'll improve sleep. It'll bring about a more restful night of sleep to really give yourself those moments of beauty ritual in the evening. I may have to start incorporating that. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I look forward to it. I really, every night I'm there and I just, sometimes it's like a 25 second ritual. I'm, I'll be completely honest. It's not always like this, you know, glorious like time where I'm able to like indulge, but just those, you know, like I say, 25 seconds, that's sometimes all it takes to really just drop in and be present and just feel where you are in your body. And, um, you know, there's kind of like this micro gratitude that happens, even if it's not something that, you know, you're consciously thinking of, it's just, how can you not experience gratitude for this being this amazing vehicle that we all get to walk around in. Amen to that. I'm going to ask you the question I ask all my guests. And that is, what does foxy and being foxy mean to you, Marissa? Hmm. Okay. Well, foxy and being foxy means being connected to whatever state emotional mental physical whatever state you're in not apologizing for it and owning it and who do you think embodies foxiness in your world at the moment well it's funny i have um i have a print of georgia o'keefe behind me in my office and even though she has long passed from this earth she is the ultimate embodiment of foxy to me even just in spirit. She is a great, um, I admire her work. I admire the way she lived and she was just so unapologetic. She never claimed to be fearless, but she was very dedicated to her work and um, just owned it. And that, that to me is the definition of Foxy. Excellent. Has there ever been a time in your life where you have not felt so foxy? And if so, what did you do to reclaim that? Bring it back? There have been many times in my life I have not felt foxy. Um, and I feel like those times 
happen um, more frequently than not. You know, it's sort of like a, an ebb and flow where there are times where I'll suddenly catch myself just feeling really um, out of touch and feeling um, bad about, you know, an emotion that I'm stuck in. Maybe I'm really swirling in an emotion of regret or, um, you know, grief where I just feel like I shouldn't be in that space. And then it's, you know, something brings me back to where I can say, oh, you know, it's okay. It's okay to feel whatever you feel. Um, but there was a time, a, an extended point of time after I had my children, I had my two girls kind of close together. They're 19 months apart. And after my second daughter, I really, looking back, I think one would call this postpartum. Um, but this was 2011. We were right on the cusp of kind of like having that be in, you know, the current medical language where people were talking about that and, and that was a thing. So I, I just remember like a good year of feeling really disconnected from myself and like the true nature of me and who I used to um, feel like um, on a soul level, like I felt just really disconnected and it was scary. It was, um, it was definitely not a foxy time. It was a messy time. And once I, you know, I don't exactly remember how, like what kind of pulled me through from that. I think it was a combination of a lot of things that, that added up to really just um, remembering that there's, there's always a choice and that there's, there's a choice for joy. There's a choice for um, acceptance and forgiveness. I really had to kind of forgive myself on a lot of things that were sort of keeping me in this eddy of depression and um, low self-worth and um, just feeling out of touch with accepting where I was and, and being a new mom, you know, to this time to two little kids and um, just being okay with, with where I was at that point in life. Forgiveness is such a big thing. I know I've talked about that with other guests in, in the past. So, I mean, there again, you're, you're, uh, you're singing the same tune. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is good stuff. Marissa, how can people find out more about you and the amazing skincare products that you produce? Well, you can always find me on my website, which is preciousskinelixirs.com. And um, I'm starting a new newsletter series called The Nourished Newsletter. So I encourage you to go sign up for my newsletter and um, see what that's all about. It's not something that I'm going to be publishing on Instagram. I'm on Instagram a lot. I try to go live and, um, you know, be present on Instagram to connect with my audience. And I found that a newsletter is really what people want, a little more of an intimate way to uh, interact. So you can, you can find all of that at my website. Okay. Well, I will include the link to preciousskinelixirs.com and your Instagram page. And I think you're also on Facebook. So I'll, are you on Facebook? I am. Yes. Okay. All right. I'll include that too. <laughs> People can find you all sorts of places, but we'll put all that in the show notes. Um, and we are bumping up on time here. So I'm going to ask you one final question. And that is, if you were to give our listeners just one piece of advice on how to maintain that foxiness, what would it be? It would be to love yourself, love yourself, love yourself, no matter where you are. Accept, forgive, just love yourself. Couldn't have put it any better. 
Marissa, thank you so much for taking the time today. I sure appreciate you being here and putting such love and light into the world. Thank you, Terry. It's been a joy.